What's up, YouTube? Today we take a deep dive into the rabbit hole that is my top 50 tips and tricks for all of the killer hot stuff. So that's face plant, snap heap, and multi pass. Let's dive in and have a look. So I've sorted this from like really beginner stuff into the more advanced stuff a little bit later on. Then we're gonna get into some more just face plant specific stuff. And then right after that, we're gonna get into the super advanced stuff where we kind of tie it all together to make some creative generative patches and all sorts of stuff. So yes, tip number one, I kind of wanna just explain the favorite system a little bit. So it occurred to me that quite a few users don't actually know about the favorite system or quite how it works. And it's actually really simple. Here I've actually got Eternum 4, which is a preset pack from another YouTuber called Alchemy Neuro, who also has some fantastic Killer Hearts tutorials. You should definitely go check that out. But say for example, we're just cycling through a bunch of these presets here in the actual main window. If you click on this heart icon, it adds that preset to a favorite. And now let's say for example, we're just uh, going through a bunch of other ones and uh, we like this one as well. Let's add that to the favorite. Now let's say for example, just close this off, just uh, delete that snap heap and let's add another one. So it automatically opens up your favorites folder when you open up the plugin for the first time. So this is actually a really cool workflow hack because it's gonna save you a lot of time. Say for example, there's like these templates and stuff that you often use in Faceplant, Multipass and Snapheap. You can quickly recall those at a moment's notice. And you can also just jump there using this favorites icon in your drop down menus on the left hand side over here. So tip number two, I wanna talk a little bit about the browser and folder behavior in the Killer Hearts stuff. So let's say for example, I'm just gonna add something on my desktop real quick. So say for example, we want to add that folder that I just added on my desktop to preset location in Snapheap. We'll go add location and then we'll browse to it over here, right? And now we've added this location. So it kind of updates this folder system live. Here, for example, if we add like another folder, let's add another folder here. And if we jump in here, we can actually see that it's actually added these two folders and if we go in and drag a couple of presets in here, so let's say for example, I'm just going to find some of my presets here. And now if we drag some of these in here, let's put some of them in the one folder. And so here we can actually jump in and you see it's updated those folders live. Here in the user presets, 
you can actually just add a new directory straight in here. And let's just call this killer hearts examples. And I'm just going to drag a couple of things here, copy those in there. And it'll automatically just update the system when you close and open it again. And so here we can then cycle through those presets. So you don't necessarily have to add the location here. You can just dump into your documents, killer hearts, presets, snappy user presets, just make a new folder there and just start saving your presets in there. I find that is a little bit of an easier way. However, sometimes some of us have an external hard drive which we save our presets onto and stuff like that. Another little handy trick is if you have the browser open, you can actually use the up and down arrow keys to cycle through the different presets. But that's a cool little feature. So tip number three is the maximum mod value inputs. This is a really, really handy one. And I believe they've added this in version two. I may be wrong about that, but check here. Say for example, if we have uh, like a frequency shifter, this is a really good example. And we have, we wanna apply modulation to this, but we only want to modulate it to a very specific frequency. Rather than using a kind of percentage value that we get here, you can, uh, instead of doing the drag, you can actually just right click and it opens up this menu over here. And then instead of putting in a, uh, a value, like a percentage over here, you can actually put in the exact amount of Hertz that we want to frequency shift by. Say for example, we want a low value like 50 Hertz. So this now gives us the ability to uh, modulate only by 50 Hertz, a very exact precise value. Very, very helpful. Okay, so tip number four is bipolar macros. This is actually really, really cool. Again, for very quite specific contexts, but here, if we have a frequency shifter and we want a macro that can either shift upwards or shift downwards. So like traditionally in like Vital or something like that, what we would do is we would just set the macro at like 50% and then just hope that the user of the preset like understands how the thing works. However, in the Killer Heart stuff, they've actually added the ability to set up your macros to work in bipolar mode. So that allows you to modulate minus 100% and plus 100% with a single parameter. So let's say, for example, we set this to modulate the frequency shifter again by a very specific value of like 500 hertz. Then this is going to go upwards by 500 hertz and then downwards by 500 hertz, depending on how we modulate this macro over here. So tip number five is being able to quantize the pitch of a sound. So this is not specific to Faceplant. You can in fact use the same system inside Snap People Multipass to quantize your resonators and all sorts of interesting things. However, just for this demo to make things a bit easier to understand, I'm going to use Faceplant and I will show you guys how to quantize the pitch of your oscillators to a specific scale in Faceplant. So first up, for those who don't understand what is quantization, um, in this context, quantization is basically locking the modulations of a sound to specific values, whether that's to a specific scale or whether it's inverting it or something like that. There's various different ways we can kind of treat this. So I think just to make things a little bit easier, let's add a LFO. And what we wanna do is we're going to try create an arpeggiator that goes up and then down at this speed of this LFO. So how we would do that is using a remap and they've actually got built in scales over here. Generally speaking, I don't like to use the whole scale. I'll just use a couple of notes in the scale, but just for simplicity reasons, what we'll do is we'll select Greg Phrygian and then let's set this to modulate by the amount of steps that were in this preset. So for example, this was 48 semitones. So then we'll set this to modulate by 48 semitones. We can actually go over here and then punch it in. So then what we're gonna need to do is set the output of this LFO to modulate that remap. And you'll see now it's going backwards and forwards, but it's stepping through these very specific values that are, dis uh, that are chosen within that Phrygian scale.
So another cool thing is that within this whole remap and LFO system, you can save presets. So for example, I've got a preset here, which is only the notes that I like from specific scales. So this is actually more useful in the context, uh, in my opinion, not using an LFO, but using something like a random generator. And then this feeds into that. And then the random basically just becomes like any note within the scale. So there I'm just holding one note and it's randomly generating values from this quantized scale. And then it's basically playing that melody automatically for us. So this is incredibly cool in combination with something like a trance gate, because then the trance gate is basically creating our kind of rhythm pattern while the melody is basically being randomly generated. So this gives us a kind of sense of repetition while the melody still gets randomly generated. Okay, so tip number six, I just want to talk a little bit about remaps and explain them a little bit for those who might not understand them. So I guess the best way to think about how a remap works is to bend the linearity of modulation. You can either invert modulation or you can change the curve of modulation. Uh, you can do uh, sequencing and all sorts of interesting things. But it's also cool to, for example, if you have an LFO that's maybe not synced to a particular grid and you want to maintain modulation that's kind of synced to that LFO, at all times, using a remap and sending that to multiple destinations is a really cool trick. So I'm going to get to that more advanced remap stuff in a little bit of a later tip and trick. But for this one, let's just talk about how a remap works. So the easiest way to outline this is probably going to be to use one of our bipolar macros that we created earlier. And let's put a filter over here. So let's say, for example, we have a frequency shifter and a filter and we want to apply different modulation curves to each of those with just one macro. So we would send this to these two remaps and then this one, for example, we would say modulate the frequency shifter and then this one we would say modulate the filter. But here you can see as we go up, it modulates the filter all the way up to the top with the frequency shifter, not all the way. Here we can actually change the linearity of how these actually work. For example, if we want to go up to the filter and then down again, because often with a frequency shifter, as you go higher, it gets a little bit too high frequency. Um, and then for example, like uh, down and then up again with the filter, you can do all sorts of interesting things like this with the remap. So check it out as we go down with the macro, watch how the filter moves like that. It goes down and then up again. So at both extents of that macro, that filter is going to go like a kind of reverse sine wave sweep. Do you see that? And then here we can actually change, uh, just do something more like a curved pattern like this for the frequency shift. Let's listen to what this sounds like just for argument's sake. Okay, tip number seven, I want to talk about basic filter types in the kilohertz system. So for those who don't know, things are a little bit different to, for example, like Serum and Vital with the filters. In Serum and Vital, you have, for example, 6 dB, 12 dB, 24 dB, and that kind of thing. Those different filters are rather represented in actual dB per octave numbers. They're represented in the amount of poles that each of those filters would need to achieve that amount of dB per octave. So for example, um, I believe one pole represents 6 dB per octave, two poles is 12 dB per octave, uh, three poles is 18 dB per octave, 24 dB, 
36 dB, etc., etc., and it goes up. You've also got the various different, you know, low pass, band pass, high pass, notch, shelf, peak, and another shelf. So you could use combinations of the basic filters to create more advanced filters. So for example, if you want a, a filter that has a, a bump at, in, at a particular frequency, you could just kind of write that in with a peak filter. So for example, let's do macro. Let's get the macro to modulate these, uh, both of these filters by 100%. Uh, actually, it should be 50%. And then say, for example, let's put in a remap, get this to the remap. And then here, let's set this gain over here. You see then how it kind of goes upwards as we modulate that upwards and then downwards as we modulate that downwards. So here, what we could do is we could then bend the linearity. You know, I explained just now about the remaps. We could now bend the linearity of this transfer function. For example, if we don't want any downward motion in that peak, we just change that with a remap. And then if we don't want it to go all the way up, we can say go down again like this. So it's kind of just got some of that really sharp resonant tone that goes up like that. We can do that there. So you can kind of create your own custom filters this way using just the basic filter types. We've also got nonlinear filter and ladder filter. So ladder filter, this is kind of based on the slightly more old school Roland and Moog filters. The transistor ladder filter, I believe, is more like a Moog. And the diode ladder filter, I believe, is more like the TB303 style filters. And obviously, you know, sound great with a bit of saturation, so you can add that. It's got that built into the ladder filter as well. However, this filter just sounds so much better with a high Q factor or high resonance than this one does. So if you want that kind of drippy, filtery sound, I would say go with the ladder filter. If you're wanting just a clean filter sound, go with the regular filter. If you're wanting a nonlinear filter, so like maybe distorted or crunchy or maybe slightly bit crushed or something like that, something that doesn't react linearly, if you want that kind of filter, then obviously go with uh, the nonlinear filter. So the nonlinear filter and the ladder filter I often find myself using in the context of leads, but just the traditional filter for that clean filter sound for basses and stuff like that, that's the one I go for. Okay, so tip number eight is creating custom filters with slice EQ. So this is actually one of my favorite ways to create these types of filters because it's got this offset parameter. So what this allows us to do is not only like tune filters to specific you know frequencies and then offset them by semitones, which is super helpful for key tracking EQs, which I'm gonna to get to a little bit later on. But we could use that as an idea for just, you know, for example, we have like, we wanna create like a band pass with two peaks, you know, and maybe like a dip in the middle. You know, let's say something like that. This is interesting, you know, something like that. And then let's say, for example, use this offset and look how it just, you know, it reacts like a regular bandpass filter, but with a single parameter sweep. So this is super helpful. So let's say, for example, use our bipolar macro again in this context. And now we have our own custom filter sweep. So we can get obviously a lot more advanced with it. You know, we don't necessarily have to use just the offset. You can modulate parameters inside Slice EQ with macros and other modulations in the host that's hosting the Slice EQ. So for example, we could modulate these peaks individually. So let's say go this one go up and this one go down. So now look how we've kind of created a pinch filter 
that inverts like that. Obviously, it's going to get quite hefty at that frequency. So what we could do is potentially create a remap that's going to turn down the gain of this one over here. So let's add a remap. Let's apply this to the remap. And then let's apply the remap to the gain of this one. We want to go downwards. So as this sweeps up, that's going to go down and then we want to go up again, down and then up again like that. That could be interesting. Okay, but we don't want to go. We don't want to do that. So remember, we're not just limited to obviously like one modulation or one macro. Now we could create, for example, like a resonance and amount which creates the, uh, which changes the peak values of these gains. So we could actually just turn these down a little bit because just so that they're not so extreme to start with, but then we can actually push it to the extreme with the resonance parameter over here. So let's go up and up. You see that? So we're gonna go quite, quite extreme, but here let's add a saturator. So distortion, uh, saturation, just turn that down a bit. So tip number nine, I just want to talk a little bit about the routing of Snap Heap. So essentially, in default, it routes from left to right. You could have a effect here and an effect here. And as long as you're not doing anything here along the bottom, this would be the same as having it underneath it. So it first runs from top to bottom down the first bus and then onto the next bus to the right top to bottom, onto the next bus to the right, top to bottom. However, what you can do is you can set the lanes to run in parallel mode. So what that means is it splits the signal. So let's say, for example, lane one and two, we set to parallel. What it's going to do is it's going to then split the signal into two, and it's going to send one duplicate through lane one and another duplicate of that signal through to lane two. Then it's going to sum those two signals and send that to lane three, and etc cetera, etc cetera. however you can see it renames the buses over here so this is now called parallel bus 1a parallel bus 1b and then it routes to serial bus 2 you could have for example three parallel buses then it routes to bus 2 you could have three parallel buses into three parallel buses into a third final bus so you could actually do all sorts of interesting routing things this way for example, you could set up like mid side things using three man EQ. So you could say you have just the lows in this channel, just the eyes in this channel, and then just the mids in this channel. And, you know, like to make it more extreme, do that. Uh, for example, let's say just split this in two and do like a mid side thing using the stereo modules. So in this one, we could say we want only the mids, no width. And in this one, we say we want only width, no mids. And then here we can run into a final kind of compressor filter kind of uh, final bus. Okay, so you can also nest snap heaps and multipass inside each other. So for example, we could have a snap heap here inside here, and then we could, for example, like choose one preset on the snap heap and then like just put a randomizer on that. And then for example, we could choose a preset here from the multipass. Okay, so let me explain how this works. So like this routing, I did this kind of a little bit crazy so that I could explain very much in detail about the routing. So parallel bus one, the audio input comes in and it splits into three channels. The first channel runs through this set of effects, second channel runs through this set of effects, third channel runs through this set of effects. Then all of those channels get bussed together and sent through this parallel bus. 
which is the set of effects and the set of effects, which then get mixed together, sent through serial bus three, which is compressor filter snap heap, and then down into this one. So the reason I often do these kinds of splits is because we have a mix control for each of the lanes. So generally speaking with the parallel stuff, I don't tend to do too much mix because then that mixes the original signal back in and with a parallel lane, you might not necessarily want that. However, in the context of like when we're doing a split, like a mid side split, sometimes it can be beneficial to reduce the amount of uh, audibility of that kind of split. But in this context where we're doing like a mid, uh, uh, like a low mid high thing, we don't necessarily want to do that. So multipass is basically snap heap, but it's the multiband version. So for those who are wondering, you know, why I did that low mid high thing in snap heap, just it was just for argument's sake to outline some things with snap heap in terms of the routing. So multipass can achieve very similar things because it's got the kind of band split system built in. So by default, you you have three lanes. So you've got a pre effects, which is before the whole uh, split system, and then you've got a post effects, which is after the whole split system, you can enable an extra two bands. So you can do a five band split if you want. And what you can do is because of the whole nesting system, you could potentially have more band splits in between the band splits and, you know, kind of just do infinite amount of band splits. So I actually just want to see, you know, with this one, we from 169 to 583. So let's put all of these in between those this is not something that you necessarily want to do but just to outline like how crazy you can get with this stuff pretty interesting so then here let's just move these up a little bit yeah again same thing uh, you can also nest snap heaps inside these multi passes so for example i'm going to put in my beat repeat snap heap <laughs> in multi pass what's different here to snap heap is you've got this post over here and what this does is this changes the mix of this effect sending to the post effects so let's say for example put something like a bit crash here which is really really apparent and we don't want low end to send through to the bit crash and turn that post down now we get clean low end through there to, to the output with no bit crash it would be the same i think as doing this <laughs> Okay, tip number 11. I want to talk a little bit about sidechain modulation. So this is different to what we think of sidechain, like LFO tool type of sidechain, but they call it sidechain in the kilohertz ecosystem. And let me explain quickly what that is. So let's say, for example, we have a filter on this drum loop with an LFO on that filter frequency. So now say for, so now say for example, we wanted to add a modulation to that amount of modulation say for example with a macro we would select the modulation output from the macro and select this yellow star so you see it's got this equals parameter you don't necessarily have to only modulate it by 100 percent. you can right click and change that but generally speaking we would be modulating it by 100 percent but this would then change the amount of lfo that is being applied to that frequency do you see what's happening there So in this context, it's probably more helpful to have the frequency up. And then as we turn the macro, the frequency goes down. Okay, so tip number 12 is how the note modulator works. So this actually changed a little bit in the kilohertz uh, 2.0 update. And I guess this is most useful in the context of like snap heap and resonator. Um, so let's say for example, add a resonator over here and let's set this to modulate this. And over here, we wanna set the extent at which we want it to modulate. So if we have it at 120 notes, I believe we wanna modulate it by 100%. And so now if we send it a MIDI, Let's just add an instrument track and send the MIDI output. Uh, let's add a note receiver and then choose instrument three. So 
So to confirm that, we can actually just use a tuner over here. Bitwig doesn't have one built in, I don't think. So I'm just going to use G-Tune. And then let's fire off a clip. And you see, if we hold a C note, it pitches to C. So if you want to change the range, for example, here, we could set it to 60 notes and set it to 50%, for example. It'll still tune to the same notes. So this little 120 notes, uh, the amount of notes range that they've added makes things a lot easier to work out in terms of that modulation. So then, for example, we could do 30 notes and then just change the amount of modulation here to 25%. So if you're using the note modulator, um, I would generally suggest leaving the root at a octave of what the resonator is over here. So for example, like let's set this to A, and then it'll still tune to whatever those notes are that are incoming if this root is also A. Okay, so tip number 13, I want to talk a little bit about the audio follower and the pitch tracker modulators. So the audio follower is basically a sidechain input that reacts and can send that exact modulation out to a particular envelope, or it derives an envelope from incoming audio signals. So you can actually see in the interface here, if we gain it up a bit, you can actually see exactly what's going on. So for example, like we could send this to any effect in the system. So something that's pretty cool is you can actually use this uh, audio follower to trigger things in the patch. So for example, if we freeze the random, let's set this to a note on never, and then we set this output to this input. You see every time it reaches a certain threshold, which you can set over here, it triggers a new random. So we could use this in the patch. So obviously, um, we have the pitch follower, which basically does a similar thing, except it derives pitch information from the audio input. So this is not always very accurate, but you can change the sensitivity to kind of get it to be a little bit more accurate. So for this kind of context where you have like a bongo sample or loop, it's not really going to pick up the pitch, but you can still use it for weird chaotic modulations in the patch. And it just makes that kind of preset that you're making more context dependent, which is sometimes pretty cool. You know, sometimes you want to just throw random samples in and get all sorts of weird movements and stuff out of the sound that you weren't really expecting. Mm -hmm. So these can also uh, react to sidechain sources if you set this to external. 
Okay, so tip number 14, I wanna talk about a cool trick you can do by freezing the LFOs and then choosing when you want to advance them. And this is cool for creating, with using a setup a little bit later on using remap switches, you can create sort of round robin techniques with samples. So just to quickly outline what I'm talking about, let's put in a sampler over here in phase plant and I'm gonna add a drum sound, okay? And uh, in fact, let's just put something a bit more. Okay, so let's jump into Snap Heap and let's put a filter over here. So let's put in an LFO, right? And if you turn it down all the way down to zero, it obviously freezes the LFO. And so now what we can do is we can set up a ramp like this, right? And what we wanna do is we wanna set up a uh, either a uh, I guess it depends on the context that we're using this. We could use a audio follower. So then what that's gonna do is it's gonna take audio input. And if that is playing, we can send this to the speed of the LFO. And now see how it advances a little bit. The phase of the LFO advances a little bit each time. So what we could do is we could actually turn this up like a lot, and then we can get a modulator to modulate the side chain of that. And then let's, for example, call this speed. And that's gonna be the speed at which it kind of goes through that round robin uh, LFO pattern that we've created. So let's say, for example, assign this to something. So in the context of phase plant, we could use this to, for example, modulate through something like a wavetable so that we're getting a slightly different sound each time we articulate it. Um, and this is really cool. Let's say, for example, choose one of these spectral tables. These are really, really nice. I generally set these down to like minus two octaves. And then let's set up a similar thing to how we had with the LFO, ramp up, change the time really, really low. Yeah, what we wanna do is set up a note gate. Now, e each time it receives a note input, it's going to trigger that on. And then let's set this to modulate the time over here. So here we don't have to use a sidechain modulation. We can just modulate this amount of output from the note gate. And notice how it re-triggers the LFO here. What we're gonna wanna do is set this to note re-trigger, never trigger from note on. You see, now it kind of like slowly modulates between that and the speed can be controlled by this. So let's set this to modulate the uh, frame of the wavetable. So that is useful in all sorts of contexts, as you can see, you know, all sorts of different contexts. One of which I'm gonna outline a little bit later on with a really cool kind of sample switching patch. So tip number 15 is the snap-in randomizer. So I kind of wish this was modulatable and I also kind of wish that there was a kind of global thing. So you could hit randomize and it does it to all of the snap-ins or some of them that you choose and that kind of thing. I think that would be really, really powerful. But how you access it is this little drop-down arrow over here. And each of the snap-ins has a random. And what that does is it just randomizes most of the parameters on it, just random values. It doesn't work with all of the parameters. As you can see with Convolver, it doesn't do fade in stretches and fade outs, and it doesn't change the actual convolution settings. That being said, you can still get some really interesting results by just, you know, happy accidents.
it can also lead to some unhappy accidents as well. So definitely use a limiter if you're doing that kind of crazy stuff like that. Okay, tip number 15. I want to talk about audio rate LFOs. So if we, for example, you can see here, LFOs have a range of zero hertz to 100 hertz. That being said is you can take advantage of the fact that like we can actually draw in custom shapes over here. And for example, turn 100 hertz into 400 hertz because now there's, you know, four waves in that shape of one wave. So now we can go up to 400 hertz, 400 cycles in that wave. Yeah, what we can do is we can kind of deduce that, um, let's say, for example, put in oscillator and let's put in a note modulator and let's get this to modulate the speed. So let's go with something like 30 notes and then let's modulate this. What we're going to want to do is set this to 22.5 hertz, right? And so that means that this cycle is running at 110 hertz because there's four cycles in one, right? And 110 hertz, I believe, is A1. So if we modulate this by, let's say, 50%, it goes up to... We want to modulate it up to, let's say, 55 hertz. And so that means we've got a note range of 12. And so this should now note track this LFO. So if, say, for example, we put uh, here onto the filter and modulate this filter like this. And we could use that to, for example, like modulate the phase of the sound. So you're probably wondering like, why are you doing that? Because you could potentially just add an LFO by adding another oscillator and using that as an audio rate LFO within the generator section. The beauty of this is being able to do this to effects in the effects lanes, not just in the generator section. So for example, like a frequency shifter, we could create a kind of FM-like sound in the effects. So you could take like a drum loop, like one of these data loops, and turn it into like a Cytron-C FM lead with just using a frequency shifter and an audio rate LFO. Okay, so tip number 17, I want to talk a little bit about the upper limit, lower limit, and the sample and hold modules in the modulator section. So I'm going to be in phase plant, but again, these are in snap heap and multipass. So a lot of people get confused between sample and hold and random because often, you know, random oscillators or random LFOs are often called sample and hold and that kind of thing. They do use a very similar idea to actually achieve the, the thing. But yeah, just for argument's sake, I want to show you exactly what the sample and hold module does, just so that there's no confusion between the random and the sample. So the random has steps, right? And say, for example, if we want to create a note on random, we could just set it to freeze. And then every time it re-triggers getting a note, then it would actually generate a new random. However, that's not the only way to create a note on random. What we could do is we could use the sample and hold module uh, for traditional sample and hold. And what that does is that takes an input, 
which we could send, for example, this modulation to, and it waits for a trigger. And when it receives that trigger, it generates a modulation value, and then it holds that value until it receives the next trigger. So the reason that a lot of random LFOs are called sample and hold is because it's the same idea inside, but there's just a clock automatically triggering it, you know, on every 16th or whatever the case is. So this is really cool in examples where we want flowing modulation on a filter, but we only want to trigger movement on the pitch every time a note is actually changed. So for example, what we could do then is send the sample and hold through a remap, set the remap to a scale of Phrygian plus minus 48, put in an oscillator, then let's set this to modulate the frequency, 48. And so now it's only gonna actually randomize the pitch when a note is received. Okay, so now what we could do is potentially put like a filter over here and then modulate this filter with the random, which is like flowing like that. Now, if we put like a long release, Okay, so let's talk about the upper and lower limit. I might be wrong in assuming this, but I believe that the lower limit was previously known as max, and the upper limit was previously known as min. So what this does is it basically sets like a limit at which the modulation can go through. So let's say, for example, send the same LFO to both of these. Notice how we're not getting any modulation movement on the upper limit. And that's because it's at zero currently and we have a unipolar modulation going in. So if we set this to bipolar, you'll notice how it now flip flops between the upper limit and lower limit. So we could use this to create, to create like a, a switch kind of situation if we wanna switch between two states. Although that being said, it is easier to do that with a remap. Um, or we could use it to, let's say do like a ramp and then combine the ramp with a sign. Let's put in another lower limit over here. Set this to bipolar. And now let's put in just one so that we can visualize the output of both of these together. So you see, what we've created here is not far from the type of shape of modulation that you would see in like a kick drum, you know, where we have that very sharp transient and then that kind of sine wavy system. So you could use these kinds of uh, maths, let's call it, to create interesting modulations and curves that are combinations of other modulations already in the patch, which is a really cool way of getting things to sound like they're reactive. So like one sound changes the sound of another sound. So for example, let's actually just uh, put this into context. I'm not sure how musical we could make this. Let's just put this onto like the pitch over here. And then let's say, for example, speed both of these up to the same speed. So for example, we might not want like the pitch modulation wobble at the end there. Let's not apply this to the pitch. Let's apply this to the level, right? and then just use that, this one, to apply this to the pitch. And now we've got a much cleaner sounding kick that we've kind of created generatively just using a combination of these upper and lower limits. And now we can shift this to fine tune that a little bit more even.
Okay, tip number 18. I want to talk about how to make random gate patterns. So let's pull up. Uh, I'm actually, you know what I'm going to do is put in a grid. I want to show you this in Snappy because I want to show you like the power of being able to do this with just effects. Um, and then here, let's create uh, maybe just like a wavetable, pull up an, FF, an FM sound. <laughs> So here I'm going to put in a filter and let's put in a random module and let's just set this to one over 16, right? And so what we want to do is we want to use a remap to decide at what value it's going to trigger a curve modulator. So here what we do is we put in a pattern. Uh, let's say, for example, put in the number 10 here and then we've got 10 stripes and the stripes are basically the percentage value. So if we have three stripes up and the rest down, this is 30% chance that it's going to send a 100% modulation out. Then what we wanna do is we wanna set a curve like this. And let's say, for example, set this to one over 16 as well. And so here, let's set this to modulate the filter and we get this to modulate this filter amount over here. So we turn this down. So we need to set this to infinite. So we don't necessarily have to do it with a filter. We could do it with a gain module if we want something to sound a little bit less filtery and more cleaner. So we set this down and then we set this to modulate by 50%. So here's another cool trick. We can actually stack this. So let's remove this curve for now. Let's put in an LFO and let's time this to one over 16. And let's set it to a ramp up. Okay, then what we wanna do is we wanna make it like super extreme. No, in fact, it's gonna be a ramp down like this. So we're creating a trigger right at the beginning. And then we set this to trigger the curve modulator, right? And then this one, we want to actually change the time using this random modulator so we can actually get these like gate patterns. So let's set this to modulate that, turn this down so this is going to then modulate that 100%. And then here we want to get this random to modulate the speed of this curve. So now we can get these random gate patterns, these random decays. And we can combine this with a filter as well, and then send this random to modulate this filter. Okay, tip number 19, I wanna talk about macro switches. So this is actually one of my favorite things to do, both in Vital and in Faceplant, because it can take a single patch and just really expand the borders of what is capable with that patch. So specifically with like snap heaps, you can use this to nest like four snap heaps in a single snap heap and then use this macro switch to switch between different snap heaps, like which one is playing to get kind of looperator style, infiltrator style effects, which I've done a video on. So you can also use this technique inside Faceplant and actually, you know, fine tune it so that it's really kind of, the things mix really nicely to switch between different samples. And then in combination with that thing that I showed you guys earlier, that round robin LFO freeze technique. Yeah, it's really, really cool. So yeah, let's open up a, a Faceplant over here. So what I wanna do is I just wanna throw in four samplers real quick. This one, let's call one, Four. I'm not going to put any samples in yet. 
And what I want to do is I want to put in a remap. Let's set a macro to modulate the remap and then duplicate it four times. Okay. The first one we want to draw in a shape that looks like this. And then we want to kind of continue that pattern, but move it along by a quadrant. And then again by another quadrant until you have what looks like a kind of sequence of gate patterns like this. Now what we want to do is we want to actually jump in here and turn all of these levels down and then get this to modulate this by 100% and then close this. And then for example, let's do this with the second one. Turn the level down and get this to modulate this by 100%. Turn this one down and modulate this to 100%. And then turn this one down and modulate this one to 100%. Cool. So we've essentially created the switch. Now what we want to do is as you can see here, look how the modulation moves between that kind of those remaps at the bottom there. At no, at no moment is two samples going to be playing at the same time. So now what we can do is we can actually jump in here and start loading just random samples in here. What I actually want to do is I just want to go into something like, um, you know, I actually had some really good results doing this with uh, tablers and that kind of thing. Okay, so check this out. Let's put in an LFO. Let's freeze it. Let's set it so that it's a ramp up. Now, what I want to do is I actually want to combine this idea of the gate to speed up the LFO with a sample and hold module. So we're going to set it so that the output of this is going into the sample and hold so that it's not going to change the sample mid sample only once the next sample is actually triggered. Then what we're going to do is we're going to set a, a note gate to speed up that LFO as we play. Then what we want to do is we want to turn this note trigger to never trigger from the note on. We also want to set this sample and hold to actually modulate the macro switch. And we've created a round robin sampler. So this in combination with like Bitwig's note repeats, man, you can get some really cool stuff with this. Okay. We are on to the face plant specific portion of this video. So firstly, I want to look at how to create serum style warp modes in face plant. So in face plant, you actually have a folder here called modulators. I don't know if you guys recognize names like ASIM and bend and remap, but these are essentially the same as serum warp modes. But how you got to set them up is you got to use these outputs over here and actually turn off this envelope output because we're not going to use that because we don't want these to be audible. Let's actually call this group warp modes. And then we set this to modulate the phase by 20%. So then if we modulate through this, you'll see that it does a similar thing to how we know as bend. And if we want a bend minus, you know, because obviously you have bend plus and bend minus, then we go minus 20%. And then it does the bend minus shape. So that's pretty cool. So this is more audible with like really kind of growly spectrally wavetables. And then somewhere around the middle is like nothing is actually happening. So if we go like this and we duplicate this, we could potentially have one modulating plus 20, one modulating minus 20. And then we could set up bipolar macros. And then we set this one to modulate the frame of this by that amount. And then this one to modulate this one's frame by that amount. Now, now we can actually have both end modes we could also like, you know, stack this up with other warp modes. For example, let's say, for example, like a ASIM 
and get this to modulate the phase by 20% as well. And then get this to modulate the frame of this one. Yeah, we do want it like in the middle again. And then we can do like a bipolar macro of this and call this one ASIM. We have like this huge tonal control using just three knobs. So there are a couple of other warp modes that aren't in there. That's obviously like FM from B and those kinds of things. You guys know how to do that. In phase plant, you obviously just use these audio rate modulators. The ring modulator and the amplitude modulator, um, this is done using modulation of another oscillator. Let's say, for example, set this down to the same as uh, pitch as that other oscillator. And then we use this to modulate the actual level of this uh, oscillator of here. So if you turn this level down and then we use this, yeah, we can actually again remove this output because we don't want this to be audible and use this to modulate this level. Now we're doing amplitude modulation using this as, as the modulation source. Okay, tip number 21. I wanna talk about how to turn on random phase retrigger. So some synths have this on by default, some don't. Vital has it on. I think Serum has it on. Faceplant doesn't, but if you do want it on, you just turn this over here to plus minus 180 on this phase parameter. See here in the right click menu, they call it phase jitter. That's the randomization of the phase. Tip number 22. I just want to explain the routing in Faceplant a little bit. So at first, it can be a little bit confusing how the routing system works in Faceplant. I first want to talk about how the effects work. So by default, you have these lanes. So for example, if we put in a couple of oscillators here, you'll see these outputs are by default sending to lane one. So both of these saw waves are going to send into lane one. It's going to get processed by all of the effects in here. Uh, for example, we can put in some effects there, then it's going to go out of there into lane two, but you can actually select that over here. And then from lane two into lane three, and then out into the master. You can, however, split the layers up. So for example, you could have one saw wave going to lane one, and then sending that to the master. You could have one saw wave going to lane two, and then sending that to the master. And then you could potentially have another oscillator sending to lane three and then sending out to the master. So you could potentially have different effects on each of these lanes and then that would create like a different effect on each of those saw waves. So let's just for example put in some randoms here just so we can get like an audio example of what I'm talking about. So the inputs into each of these lanes is the same. So essentially what we're doing is we're creating a parallel effect. However, it's only the same because these oscillator settings are the same. We can change the oscillators or we can create a kind of split system, which I'm going to talk about shortly. So what we want to do is just get this to modulate like this effect, this one to modulate this effect over here, and then this one to modulate this effect here. It's probably not going to sound very musical, but just for an example of what I'm talking about. So for example, we could uh, have different oscillators here. We could put in a wavetable. Over here, we could put in a like a noise or something like that. But let's say for example, if you wanted like the one uh, oscillator to send through all of these layers, like a duplicate, what you could do is you could actually add a, another output, like an envelope over here, and then send this to lane two, and then add another one over here, envelope, and then send this to lane three. So now we have independent outputs with envelope control sending to each of these lanes with the same source input.
Tip number 23, I wanna talk about the different unison modes in Faceplant. So over here on your oscillators, each of the oscillators has their own individual unison controls. You have several different more advanced unison settings. This one, a smooth is kind of just like your average unison that you would expect from most synths, where it does a kind of equal detune, which you can then change with this amount over here. If you want to, for example, tune the unison voices to particular chords or octaves, you can do that over here on the right hand side. You've got several different options. Uh, let's go with like a minus seventh. Yeah, when you're using the chord modes, you generally don't want to use this detune because that's going to detune it further from the actual root notes. Can you hear that? So like when you're using the chord modes, generally speaking, you don't want to use the detune. You can change the amount of voices over here. Then you've got several controls here of how the different voices interact. So blend would be to mix between from the original signal, which is just the saw wave, and how much unison you're blending in. And then balance is the uh, spread between the upper and lower voices. So it kind of like tilts the volume of those voices. So this helps to, for example, like invert the chord. And then spread, obviously, pretty self-explanatory. It spreads the voices across the stereo spectrum. So you've also got more experimental stuff like uh, frequency stack and pitch stack, which I believe changes the pitch frequency distance between the voices as a ratio of this detune. And then you've got the good old shepherd tone. So to get this working, in my opinion, like the, the, the kind of the most organically is again, use the detune on zero and then just modulate the center position and you get this super nice harmonic sounding sweep. That's really good in combination with like a reverb or shimmer kind of sound um, to make these really big pads. We maybe just want to turn this amount of sweep down so that it's like more of a gradual sweep between those harmonics. Oh, so good, so good. So there's also a global unison mode right here at the bottom. And here you've actually got the same settings, which they've, I think they added those in V2. I believe in V1, it was just a very simple global unison. But say for example, you've got a sound here, but then you like you've made it and everything's pre-rooted and you just wanna make that full voice or that full patch bigger with unison. This basically applies unison settings to your entire generator section. So for example, now we can just make this a little bit wider with just some ever so slight smooth detune unison. Okay, so tip number 24. I wanna talk about the several ways which you can make either note on randoms or triggered randoms in Faceplant. So I did kind of talk about one of the ways a little bit earlier on in the video where the random, if you just turn it to zero speed, it stops creating random frequencies. And then as long as your trigger mode is set to always receive uh, note on, you'll see each time I, I hit a 
key on the MIDI controller, I'm busy hitting keys now, it generates a new random value. And then when I stop, when I stop hitting, it stops creating values. So that's one way of creating note on randoms. And you can kind of stack this so you can create as many different note on randoms as you want. For example, here we have three note on randoms. What we could potentially also do is we could create a traditional random. Let's just set the smooth and jitter all the way up just so that it's completely chaotic. It's not following any particular kind of movement or pattern. And then let's turn the speed up as well. And you'll see now here, we've got a very chaotic pattern. It's kind of like, almost like noise. If we turn it up like this, it kind of looks like noise. The speed doesn't really matter because what we want to do is we want to use one of these sample and hold modules. And we want to send this input into that. So now by default, it's actually set to note on uh, triggers as well. So now each time I hit a note, you'll see it generates a random based on what the point of this modulation was at the time when you hit the note. So this doesn't only work with notes, you can actually trigger randoms with a sequence as well, which I think is very, very cool. So what we can do is we can quickly just build a patch. See here, I'm hitting the notes and now we've got this random, which it's kind of, prog it's a programmed random. So this is more likely to generate a sequence of values repetitively, whereas just mathematically, because this one is so much more chaotic, this one is much less likely to repeat a pattern. Whether you can hear that repetition or not is, is beside the point. So what we can do quickly is just add a wavetable. Crystal is pretty good. Turn the pitch down two octaves. And then what we can do is we can set one of these note on randoms to randomize the frame position. Let's in fact set this to positive values only. So I've got a beat repeat snap heap here that I've made. Um, I have done a video on this. I'll try to remember to put, post the link in the description. So let's use a remap and set this sample and hold to the remap. And what I want to do is I want to use something like this to determine that at only 80% of these randomization triggers, is it going to turn this mix on? So you see how it randomly add a note on random. It enables that beat repeat. What I also like to do is to use a similar idea, but with a delay and we modulate the delay time, for example, with one of the note on randoms. And we do a similar thing with the mix over here with the remap. So let's just duplicate this and let's send this output to the mix over here. And what we can do is we can actually just change the pattern so that maybe sometimes there's a beat repeat, sometimes there's delay, etc. Okay, so tip number 25, I want to talk a little bit about MPE and poly effects in phase plant. So firstly, I just want to explain the poly effects because that's a little bit easier to wrap your head around. So let's say, for example, we put a oscillator over here with a saw wave. If we use a filter over here in the generator section, it's, it automatically uses polyphony for the generator section. However, the effects, it doesn't, but you can set it so that it does. For example, what I'm talking about with the different voices, here we've got an LFO. Let's apply this LFO to the uh, the filter cutoff over here. And if we trigger, for example, a chord, but the two notes at different times, notice how it kind of moves those two voices independently in terms of that filter. We can add more voices into the mix to kind of make it sound, to make it more obvious. Oh, in fact, actually, what we need to do is we need to set this note retrigger to never trigger from note on so that it's just going to be a free floating LFO.
So you can actually use this as a kind of sequencer so that you can kind of have these voices floating in and out from each other. It's actually a really nice technique for, for ambient and kind of background pads and that kind of thing. Let's say, for example, if we turn this filter off and we tried that with a filter over here and we set this to modulate this filter, look what happens. It's not applying an individual filter to each of those polyphonic voices. If we set this poly to on over here, it does. And the random modulators also work with the individual voice. As you can see here, there's all these little gray dots jumping. That's a different random curve for each of the voices in that chord that's being held. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how Faceplant handles uh, MPE. So automatically the pitch and everything is uh, automatically determined your MPE stuff. What you might want to do is just make sure that this bend range is the same as the bend range in whatever MIDI editor thing you're using for MPE. And let's just apply some MPE parameters over here. For example, MPE timbre and pressure, which are the two parameters that we can actually grab quickly from the Bitwig. MIDI MPE editor. And let's apply, for example, like a filter, and then maybe a little bit of vibrato. That could be really, really cool as well, I think. Tambo can do the filter, and then pressure can do the vibrato. Okay, so once we've set up a bunch of parameters, like the MPE pressure and the timbre, then we can actually go into the MIDI editor over here. We might wanna just make sure that we've set this use MPE on over here in Bitwig, and you see here it says plus minus 48. We just wanna make sure that that matches the bend range over here. So let's set that to 48. And now it should be able to like pick up, if we draw in a note, the micro pitch editing should be able to pick up exactly what the note is which we're bending to, and that kind of thing, just to make things a little bit easier.
So you hear like each note in that like chord and in that progression, each note that's being held has its own individual vibrato, its own individual filter, all of these effects, ensemble, harsh, chorus, they're all on those individual voices and that just makes it stack and sound so huge. So the poly effects are definitely the trick to get this really big cinematic sound. Okay, so tip number 26, I wanna talk about how to turn off the key tracking in the oscillators. So this is really handy for making like percussive sounds, for example, like snares and kicks. And say, for example, you want the fundamental to hit a particular frequency as opposed to a ratio of the keyboard input that you're busy sending it. So for example, let's say put in a sine wave and if we play different notes on the keyboard, you'll notice that the sine wave changes pitch. To turn that off, what we do is we turn this harmonic to zero. Now, we don't actually get any sound. What we have to do is we have to actually set the exact frequency that we need here in this uh, shift parameter. So say, for example, we want a kick that ends at exactly, let's say, 55 hertz. Now we know, like, no matter what key we input, it's always going to be root note at 55. Now what we can do is we could use a curve parameter, for example, and then set this curve to modulate like a very sharp thing like this, turn it down so that we can like modulate the pitch. So you'll notice now the semi doesn't actually react to modulations anymore, but that's because these parameters are based on the ratio input of the keyboard. So now we're gonna be using the shift parameter. So say for example, we want to go all the way up to like 5K. Now let's just dial in the exact shape that we want here. So here's a really handy thing is we can actually use the note parameter to modulate the amount of pitch, but it's always gonna end at a particular root note. So the fundamental will always be the same, but the note input determines the extent at which the pitch uh, sweeps from. So that's a really cool little trick. This is also really good for stuff like snare drums. So for example, we could just tune this up to 550 or something. And then what we could do is we could add like a noise source and then give that like a curve modulation. Okay, tip number 27. I wanna talk about how to remove the fundamental from a saw wave. So this is particularly helpful for various situations. Generally, you wanna use a wavetable. So there is actually a, a wavetable here already that does this under saws and it's called fundamental saw. So what this does is it actually sweeps from no fundamental to extended fundamental where halfway is a saw wave. We go to like the halfway point, I think that's like 127, 128. It's a saw wave. And then if we modulate downwards from there, we're then removing the fundamental of the saw wave. So we can actually do this manually by adding a wavetable, create a saw wave, and then let's go into the editor. And over here, we can set this pencil icon and just draw the first fundamental tone down. And you'll see what it's done is it's actually created a, the same shape as we had with that fundamental saw wavetable. So why is this a cool technique? For example, if we're creating like a very Reese uh, detuned unison saw, we don't necessarily always want like the super low end sound in there with that saw wave. And the really nice technique is then to add it again with a clean sign. So for example, let's add a sine wave, pitch it to the same uh, pitch as that other oscillator. And now we've got this kind of very detuned saw, but the fundamental is clean. So it's kind of very much easier to determine the pitch of that sound. So this gets really apparent when you start to distort these layers. So for example, let's add like a lot of distortion to 
the Reese layer and maybe some filters, uh, some notches. And what we can do is put some randoms and then just stack these notches up and then modulate them with different randoms. So like I said, this is cool because now we've got this clean sign which we can manipulate in various ways. What I like to do is saturate and add a very, very quiet noise layer in there just to give that sub some movement. And then of course we can process these layers individually. So we can have layer one going to the sign, out to layer three, lane three, and then lane two. This can be like our source layer. You see that top layer is just a mess, but the bottom layer is semi clean. It's got a tone to it. So we still get a relevant kind of musical sound going on. Really, really nice technique that one. Tip number 28, I wanna talk about some of the wavetable editing capabilities. So obviously let's add in a wavetable over here. So if we hit this pencil icon, it opens up our wavetable editor. It does help if you have another screen, to be honest with you, because you can just put the wavetable editor there. While you're editing it, you can change the frames and do all sorts of stuff here. However, that being said is we can actually just make the window a little bit smaller, makes things a little bit easier to deal with because now we can, for example, go like this and we have access to the frame here while we're editing our wavetable. So I wanna talk So I want to talk about the several ways we can use the wavetable editor to generate new wavetables. So what we could do is it uses like a keyframe system. So for example, we could either draw in like freeform shapes with the pencil tool, or we could draw in kind of more stepped shapes uh, using the, the curve drawing tool. I like to use a bit of a mixture of both because then you can get these kind of really complex wavetables that still have some kind of shape in them, but with little intricacies because that can get some really complex sounds. Okay, so now what we can do is we can jump like over here, for example, and let's draw in another wavetable, something like this could be interesting, I think. And then let's go over here, do the last keyframe, and then we can draw in something over here. So now what we wanna do is we can actually give each of these frames uh, like a mix so that they mix in and out of each other. So for example, we could go like this and then use this one and choose like where blends from, like this, for example, uh, and then let's go this way uh, and like this so that we can kind of get a, a smooth blend. And so there are different blend modes that we could choose from here. We could do either linear, which is amplitude based, or we could do spectral, which is frequency based. So I guess it depends on the type of sound you want. You know, spectral often creates a little bit more complex frequencies, while linear is more kind of analog shapes and that kind of thing. Let's see the difference between spectral and linear. You see linear sounds kind of cleaner in terms of the sweep, but sometimes you want more complex sounds and more kind of artifacts in that signal. So for now, let's just stick with linear. And say, for example, we want to commit this shape that we've created, this sweep. Then what we do is we click done. And what it's done is it's now saved this wavetable editor, which saved this wave shape as a wavetable, which we can then further edit either with the harmonics tool. So we can go in here and actually edit each of these, like I explained with the fundamental trick. Say for example, if we wanna remove just like the low frequency here, we can actually change the DC offset as well um, of the entire thing or remove two harmonics from the bottom. Um, and then we can do that. And we can also then change how that blends back in with the original. There's also a frequency filter tool. So this is like a spectral filter. 
So what it allows you to do is actually like filter off either the tops or you know there's actually different filter shapes which you can choose over here. So we can do like band pass type stuff where you can kind of sweep through the frequency and you can use these like keyframes here, for example, to do a sweep. So then here, let's say go from like a low frequency, change the slope so it's quite sharp, and then let's sweep up to a high frequency like this. So you just click at the bottom and you see it adds like a blue uh, keyframe, and then it allows you to actually change the parameter. And now if we sweep, it does like a band pass filter sweep. So here in the middle, it got a little bit sharp. We can actually add a point here and then modulate the gain downwards. So here, for example, the gain will go up here, the gain up a little bit. But then in the middle where it gets sharp there, we want the gain to kind of go down a little bit and maybe open up the, the, the peak a little bit. So you can kind of create your own custom filter sweeps in, in the Wavetable editor, which is really, really cool. So once we've done that sweep, let's commit that. Okay, so tip number 29. I'm still in the Wavetable editor. I wanna talk about some of the more advanced effects and stuff that we can apply to our Wavetables. So you've got a bunch of different effects here. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but they, they are actually explained in the manual. You've got self FM, which kind of FMs itself. Um, and then you can choose various parameters. Sine FM, which FMs the signal with a sine wave. And then you can choose different parameters and that kind of thing. Distortions, phase offset, power sync, which is really cool. My favorite though is disperse. This is essentially the disperser effect from kilohertz, um, but you can actually do it into the negative domain. And this creates like a crazy wobbly sound. And of course, you know, because of the whole keyframe system, we can actually jump in here and then modulate, for example, the amount up to a positive domain so that when we sweep, it it sweeps the disperser backwards or like forwards from negative to positive. As you can hear, sometimes this will create some clicks, but we can then go back to the sweep and um, the crossfade system and then add uh, or, or edit that a little bit to make it a bit more kind of a bit less clicky. So what we're going to want to do here is commit this. And then let's click here and then maybe choose spectral. Let's see what linear does. And so let's sweep to that middle frame and then sweep to the end frame. So you've also got various like fixes like uh, to normalize, for example, normalize RMS so that they would all be a similar kind of volume when you do a sweep like that. And you've also got uh, DC offsets. Uh, you can invert the time and the amplitude of the signals and various other things. Align the fundamentals so that the phase will always be, so that as you sweep, it'll always be in phase and at various other things, all phases. So one last thing about the Wavetable Editor, you can actually import samples uh, by clicking here, create from samples, but you can also actually drag samples directly in from your browser. I know this works with Cubase and Bitwig. I'm not sure about Ableton and that kind of thing. So here we could create, for example, our own I can has kick type sound, but it's a bit softer because there's crossfade on the uh, frames, which we want to reduce a little bit. Okay, tip number 30, I wanna talk a little bit about audio manipulation and loops and that kind of thing in the sampler in Faceplant. So remember I mentioned about being able to turn off the key tracking of oscillators. So this works for samples in the oscillator. So I think the best way to describe this is if you have a note coming in at C, which is gonna trigger the, th the thing, what you wanna do is you wanna turn this off and set it to the frequency that you know C is. I kind of just off off the top of my head just know A. If we set this to A4 and then this to 440, it'll play the exact tempo at which the sample was recorded at. So here, for example, if we set our project to that tempo, which is 140, then we can actually create loop-based stuff with that sample 
in the project. So let's just say, for example, put in any note will do because it's not now, uh, it's not a ratio of that input anymore. You see how it loops perfectly. So potentially what we could do now is we could set up like uh, a remap and set a macro to the remap, duplicate it, and create a switch that's going to switch between these two like this. And so now what we can do is get this one to modulate this, this one to modulate this, Let's turn them both down to zero, and now we can randomize that macro. Introducing Catalyst, the carefully curated collection of transitions, creative effects, and mangling presets for Snap Heap. Catalyst consists of several categories of preset styles, ranging from complex or automatic transition making racks to creative effects, filters, glitchy mangling mayhem, and even some mixing templates. The collection of transition presets is designed to take boring loops to the next level. The filters and creative effects are designed both as creative starting points for your faceplant patches or interesting ways of processing your external audio loops and plugins. The Mangler presets are designed to quite literally destroy your sounds, but that good kind of destruction, you know? There's even a collection of templates for mixing to get your project off the ground very quickly. Catalyst consists of 100 presets available now. Information is in the description. Okay, so tip number 31. I want to explain how I made this shimmer reverb type effect. This is really, really nice on leads in combination with like a delay and a reverb, some wideness processing. Okay, so the trick with this shimmer reverb is we want three parallel lanes. One is gonna be our dry signal, one is gonna be a pitched up signal by an octave, and one is gonna be a pitched up signal by two octaves. So we wanna use a little bit of reverb here on both of these channels. We can still fine tune it a little bit in a moment, but just the kind of quick parameters is that we want like the mix on 100% on both of these, decay down a little bit because we're still gonna have like a, like a master reverb on like the whole channel, if that makes sense. Then what we wanna do is we want a pitch shifter on both of these. So the interesting thing about pitch shifters in general is they kind of create a bit of like a granular type of sound. So to make the best use of that, let's turn this correlate off and so that the granules have a bit of kind of jitter so that they're not like perfectly in tune. And that's what gives it a bit of that kind of shimmery effect, I think. So let's say uh, plus 12 semitones on this one and plus 24 semitones on this one. So now what I like to do is just put a bit of filter on these to remove some of the lows. Uh, you know, sometimes with granular processing, some extra lows can sometimes get uh, creep into the mix. Then I also like to add a bit of reverser. This just smears the signal a little bit more and then some harsh, which is kind of like a stereo type of effect. So this is the first stage of the shimmer effect is this kind of dual a pitch shift reverb thing that's happening as well as the dry signal. So let's just have a listen to what's happening uh, to, to what this effect that this has on the sound. <laughs> Can you hear those like ghostly things? What I like to do is sometimes maybe set the reverses to different speeds. 
so that they kind of wash in and out of each other. Let's mess around with these reverb settings as well to maybe get like a bit more spectrally kind of effect going on there. That's good. That's good. I like that. So what I want to do is I want to apply a macro that's going to be our dry volume. So let's say put a gain in here and set this to modulate by 50. Just call this dry. Sometimes you want dry control here as opposed to the wet of the full mix because here we're going to have some extra effects. So this parallel lanes feeds into a delay which we're going to set to a 3 over 16 set to ping pong. So we have to set the pan and then maybe reduce the feedback and the mix a little bit. So it's not as apparent. Then we're going to add a another reverb over here just to kind of like smear out the whole effect. Maybe reduce the mix ever so slightly here. Let's listen to what this sounds like. We can perhaps also put in a macro that's going to control the volumes of these upper, like these upper octave voices. So let's have, for example, this one. We can call this oct one. This one oct two. And then here we can have uh, another macro that's going to control like the overall, the extra effects. Okay, tip number 32, I want to talk about remap stacks and folders. So what I mean by this is on macros, you're limited to the amount of modulations that you can apply to a particular kind of thing. So let's say, for example, I'm just going to put in some random stuff here, I'm not really thinking too much about it. And here, let's say, for example, put in wavetables, I'm just going to try max out the amount of modulators that we can put here, for example. All of these are going to be modulating the phase a little bit. And then this can be the sidechain for all of those, as well as various parameters here, like the phase, the wavetable position, do a bunch of stuff here in the effects. Uh, let's put a filter here, or bit crush as well. Filter, frequency shifter. Yeah, now we are at the maximum. Now what do we do if we want to apply more modulations to this one macro, you know, we're limited now. So what I like to do is generally when I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to make a more complex patch, I won't even bother with assigning multiple stuff to a macro. I'll generally just straight off the bat, assign the macro to a remap, right? And then the macro, there's like one assignment going to the remap, right? Let's put this remap into a folder or a group. And what we can do here is let's just start removing some of these. And then let's assign a bunch of stuff to remaps over here. So for example, it was this one, what we can do is now duplicate this, this one, maybe this one as well. So here we can actually bend the linearity of these modulations. So not only do we have now the ability to kind of keep stacking it and keep stacking it so that, you know, one macro controls much more modulations in the patch because you can have, you know, as many remaps as you want. Yeah, what I want to show you real quick is if we take a remap and just remove these, map this modulated, uh, this macro to the remap, or in fact, let's just do the first macro, right? I want to show you there's a freedom in doing it this way because now we can potentially Say for example, we're busy modulating something with a macro. Then we decide we actually want to modulate that with LFO. We can just change the input here to the remaps and then uh, we freed up a macro. And we don't have to bother then worrying about changing all of these different modulations because it's all just in one remap stack. So then let's set this remap output to these two, right? We can keep expanding this idea. Let's put this as the first one in, in the stack. And then these, for example, let's get to, to modulate all of these comb filters like we had before. So it's actually a bit easier to do it on one and then just duplicate the comb filters like this, for example. We also had some stuff modulating the phase of some of these oscillators as well. Duplicate this remap, phase, wavetable position. 
So yeah, not only now do we have the ability to create many more modulations in the patch, but it's a little bit simpler because now this whole weird system of modulations is nested in a group. And we just have to think about that one input that's going into the group that's going to trigger that whole uh, slew of different modulations and stuff like that. So here, this was controlling that, for example. And this was controlling that as well. Doing the frequency shifter a little bit. Some of this stuff as well. So we can just keep going and keep going. You know what I mean? We're not limited whatsoever. <laughs> So now say for example, we want to free up this macro. Now we've got this really complex patch going on and we actually want a random modulating this macro. We could just unassign this macro is now free, add a random in here and get the random to modulate the remap. Let's just set it to positives only uh, to modulate that remap. Now we've got that whole system nested in a group. So simple, just a, now we freed up a macro as well. So that is the remap stacks and folders to free up extra macros and modulations in your patch. So on the theme of freeing up macros and extra macros, you could use an LFO as an extra macro. So what we could do is potentially just set an LFO to ramp up and then freeze it by turning the modulation phase all the way down to zero. What we're gonna wanna do is set it to never trigger, otherwise it's gonna change the modulations as we, you know, as we trigger a note, which we don't necessarily want. Then let's, for example, we want a macro to control this, right? And all of our macros are finished over here. What we could do is we could just use this, right? And now we could use the phase of this to control the amount. Are you guys seeing what's happening there? So you could use this phase as an extra macro. And if you right click, you can say assign to automation slot, slot one. And then in your DAW, you can actually uh, automation slot one. Now we can actually modulate this. <laughs> So you're not actually limited to eight macros. You could just, you know, keep extending it, use remap stacks, use LFOs, and just really go wild with these crazy patches that you can do with it. Okay, so tip number 34, I wanna talk about key tracked EQ. So you don't necessarily have to do this in Faceplant, you can do this with Snapheap on various other plugins and just send MIDI from the actual device. Um, you know, if you're using a Bitwig, it'll actually pick up the MIDI directly from the channel that you put it on. So if we use, for example, like a note modulator, um, it's gonna automatically assume the root note that's coming in is A, which we're gonna leave it at because I just know the kind of um, harmonic frequencies of A off the top of my head. So it'd be 55 hertz, 110 hertz, 220, 440, 880, etc., etc. So for example, sometimes we wanna remove like the second and third harmonics from a sound. Let's actually just increase the Q factor of these just a little bit. Like I know you could just do it in the wavetable editor, but say for example, you don't want that, you know, say for example, you want to, you know, there's like maybe a particular sound that key tracking of an EQ actually creates, you know, like a phase offset or something like that. And say you want that. So 
we could create this like pattern. And so now all these frequencies are at different octaves of A and we could use this offset parameter over here and then key track that with the note input. So if we set this to 100% and leave it at 120 notes, it should key track at an A. However, we might just want to offset this by, let's say, I think three octaves because the note input is a bit lower. And so now as we play, you can, uh, let me actually pull up a spectrum so we can see exactly what's going on there. Let's say, for example, go a bit more drastic with it. So let's say all these gains like all the way, and then we can just use the mix parameter as a kind of uh, fine tuning. So the cool thing about this kind of key track EQ as opposed to your traditional style of like effect EQ is we could set this to poly mode and now it key tracks each of those voices independently. So now we could have a chord where each of the chords, we have like individual harmonic control over those. And we can even modulate that to create weird phasey effects, which is pretty cool. Tip number 35, I want to talk about advanced chaining of more simple sequences. So let's say, for example, if we're creating like a simple arpeggiator using an LFO, let's say, for example, just set this to sync, something like four over four. Uh, now what we can do is let's just put in some notes over here, get this to modulate the pitch. In fact, let's send this through a remap. And what we want to do is we want to send this positive modulation and we want to set a scale plus 24 Phrygian. And then we get this to modulate this by 24 semitones. Okay, so we've got a simple pattern here. Say for example, we wanna duplicate this and we wanna create another simple pattern. So let's just get this to modulate the remap by 100% as well, or by one. And then we can use these kind of amounts here to select which of the sequences is currently playing, right? So let's go in here and I'll choose a different, uh, write in a different pattern. And let's just keep expanding that idea. So now we have these four LFOs, right? What if we could create a system that can modulate between all of those LFOs? So let's say, for example, set a macro to a remap over here macro to a remap. Then I want to use a nested folder idea like I was talking about earlier. So let's put this in here and add another remap. And let's set this one to this one. And then we want to duplicate it four times, right? So here in the first one, we want to modulate up in the first quadrant and then down again. And then we just want to keep doing that idea, but step it along one quadrant so like this, duplicate like this and then the last one like this. And then we're gonna assign those to modulate, each one is gonna modulate the LFO amount. So the first remap is gonna obviously modulate the first modulation amount by 100%.
So now you can see as we modulate this, it's going to turn that off. You see that? And so now we just carry that on. So second one modulates the second LFO. This can be a little bit confusing um, to get all the routing correct. That's why it's pretty cool that they've added these orange stripes. Just helps to keep things a little bit in, more in order. One, two, three, modulating this one's amount. And then the last one modulating this one's amount, which was already up. So we actually need to turn that down. So now we should be able to modulate between these four patterns using this macro. So then taking that idea from earlier, you know, about freeing up the macros, we could then, you know, unassign this from the first remap and put in an LFO over here. Let's set this one to ramp up and let's set this to very, very slow. Let's see, like, what's the slowest we can do? A 64 over 4. And then we get this to modulate this remap. Now we have an incredibly long sequence that's modulated by this LFO speed. Maybe let's not go 64 over 4. That seems like a little bit slow. But now it'll loop the first one a couple of times, then move on to the second one, then on to the third one, and on to the fourth one. So this is a nice way of creating these ARPs that kind of evolve using simple building blocks, but then modulating between those building blocks. So for this to work, instead of getting it to re-trigger every note, we actually want to maybe make the clip a lot bigger. So let's just say scale, scale, scale. That should work now. And then another trick that I like to do is, let's say for example, add an LFO here. Let's set this to bipolar modulation. And we also want like a very long sequence. Let's say again, 32 over four. And what we wanna do is use this one to switch octaves up and down. So let's just actually just jump in here for now and turn off the modulation or get it all to sit at the center point, the zero crossing or whatever, and then get this to modulate by 12. So it can go up an octave, stay at the same octave and then down an octave. And then we jump in here and we draw in some square shapes like this uh, semi-randomly. number 36 I want to talk about sequencing with a wavetable so I actually have a preset in the factory library we can check here wavetable I've actually created a preset for the faceplant factory presets which takes a wavetable and converts it into a melody using a quantizer there's actually I figured out a new way of doing this slightly better and what we need to do is basically let's add an LFO table uh, let's just choose one of these spectrals. It's got a lot of like nice movement in it. Let's make this really kind of really slow. Then what we want to do is we want to use a sample and hold. You know, remember this one from earlier. And what this can do is this can take a gate pattern. Let's say uh, ramp down and make it something like this. And now we use this to determine the frequency of our melody because this is now gonna gate this. So if we hold this down, okay, we need to send wavetable information into the sample and hold. Notice how it generates a new random based on the wavetable position, 
we can actually just smooth this out a little bit just to make things a little bit more obvious. And now it's always in sync. So that's pretty cool. And now we can send this sample and hold output into the quantizer to make sure that the pitch is going to always be in a particular scale. So let's go remap. Let's say origin. Let's add in oscillator 24. So this is best combined with something like a trans gate because that's going to create our, uh, our rhythmic pattern for the sound. Uh, and then let's add some effects over here. Tip number 37 is combining a series of modulations to create interesting and unique sequences. So that could be for pitch or any type of modulation in your patch. Another interesting thing is you could perhaps use a combination of several modulations to derive pitch and a combination of other modulations that maybe share similar values to derive something like gate. That way you can have these kind of semi-generative patches, but that still have a sense of some sort of rhythmic basis or some sort of kind of pitch basis. So anyway, let's dive into phase plant and I wanna show you the easiest way to do this. So the idea is to combine, for example, multiple different sources to create a, like a output modulation. So this could be something like a wavetable as well as a LFO or a wavetable as well as a random or something like that. We could also perhaps use uh, two wavetables and then just, you know, phase offset them to create these differences in the different sequences and that kind of thing, or have like different wavetable frames to create these kind of different combinations. So the idea is, or at least the easiest way I like to do this is using a scale module. So what this does is it basically allows you to scale up modulation or scale down modulation that's going through it. So we can send this to the scale uh, and you can see uh, at the moment it's a full positive value. So if we send this uh, at a value of one as well, you'll see it actually clips the modulation amount. So what we wanna do is we actually wanna turn this down and you see we've still got this kind of like clipping happening on the actual modulation itself. So to counteract that, what we can do is we can actually set each of these modulation depths to 50%. And now you see we've got that kind of full range with the combinations. And now if we kind of offset the frame, now we've derived like a different pattern uh, from this modulation. So like I said, we could actually have another wavetable here. Let's perhaps choose a different actual wavetable itself. And let's say, for example, use this to derive like the combination of these two we could use to calculate our gate pattern, let's say. So let's send this one to this as well as this one to this. We have to just open it up and say one. So now the final thing we can do is we can create a third one, which is gonna be a combination of the last two that we haven't uh, duplicated yet. And we can use this to, for example, like modulate the filter or something like that in the patch. So here what we're gonna do is let's just put in a, an analog oscillator and actually close these up for now and just uh, visualize using these uh, three scales modules. So what I wanna do is for the pitch, I actually wanna use a sample and hold and I also want to use a remap. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send the output of this into the sample and hold and now we can trigger the sample and hold at a particular kind of, at, at a, a particular rate. So let's say for example at a one over 16 and then put in a shape like this and then we can send this output to the sample and holds trigger. And now you see it actually derives a value each time it re-triggers. So now we have a basic kind of like op generating system here. We need to just make sure that this is at a particular kind of scale or something like that. So what we can do is send this to the remap and then let's open this up and, or in fact, no, we just choose from one of these presets. So scales 48, choose the Phrygian. And then we get this to modulate the pitch by 48. 
So I think in this context, it would be 24 because it's plus 24 and minus 24. And the overall range of this remap is 48. Okay, so we've got a relative uh, pitch happening here. Now what we can do is with the second scales, we can set this so that when the random goes above a certain point, it's going to trigger a gate. However, we want the same kind of sample and hold behavior being applied to this kind of modulation over here. So let's set this to sample and hold, and let's set this LFO to trigger this sample and hold as well. So now we have this kind of gate pattern happening here. Now what we wanna do is we wanna use this to determine a, whether the note is being played or not. So let's set this to remap. And then instead of assigning this to a kind of scale or something like that, we need to actually s assign binary values. So that for example, like 20% of the time, it's actually going to gate upwards like this. You see that? So then let's turn this level down and then we can actually use this to modulate this level over here. Set it to 100%. Okay, so this last one for the filter, we don't necessarily have to do any kind of modulations uh, to this output. We can leave it as like a, uh, as it's as it is, and just send this to like a filter, for example. And then just to uh, round it all off, I'm going to put a slow LFO on that filter as well, just to kind of give it some extra modulation. And then we're going to add some effects over here. So now all we need to do is just change the shapes of these three LFO tables to get vastly changing melodic patterns, rhythms, and all sorts of things. Tip number 38 is triggering curves and other sources from a sidechain audio. So this is really cool in Snappy. For example, if you want to uh, randomize like a filter or other type of parameter, but based on the beat of another channel in your project. Uh, it's also really cool for creating kind of sidechain mapping with really snappy curves uh, or kind of creating your own type of LFO tool type stuff that reacts to a beat. So for example, I know a lot of people use MIDI to trigger stuff because you actually have control over the envelopes. I wanna show you a really cool thing uh, using this technique. So in Bitwig, if you set this button over here, you can actually choose the uh, audio sidechain channel that's gonna be sent to the sidechain channel of your VST3 plugin. So in Snapheap, for example, if you go over here to the audio follower, if you set external, You'll notice how this now reacts to the drum channel as opposed to the audio channel that it's on. So it's on this kind of pad channel, but it's grabbing the external sidechain source from the kick and snare channel. So this is really cool for sidechaining or for other things which we're gonna get into. So the first um, and probably the most obvious thing why this is really cool is to trigger like a curve modulator. So let's say, for example, draw in something like a, this shape from zero to 100%, and we trigger it with this. What we wanna do is we wanna actually set this to never trigger from a note on. So now what's gonna happen is, notice every time a kick or a snare appears on the other channel, it's gonna trigger this curve sequence. So this, for example, if we set it to like a gain, and we set this down uh, to, actually we wanna turn it to percentage and set it down to 0% and then set this to modulate up to 50% or up by 50%. Check how we got this really nice side chain when we can actually draw in the exact curve 
that we want for the sidechain and the amount of time that it takes to sweep through that kind of sidechain uh, pattern. So this is also really cool for triggering stuff like randoms. Let's say, for example, add a random and turn it to freeze. So now nothing is actually going to trigger the random except if we send it a source. So here, let's send it the kick snare pattern. And now check this. It generates a new value on the kick and on the snare. So for example, let's say uh, apply like delay. This is obviously going to be like the most obvious and then do like a different time every time. Okay, so tip number 39 kind of goes hand in hand with this one. It's creating LFO tool inside Snappy. I guess I could have probably put this one before because it's less complex, but I kind of wanted to tie this one in, like I said. So you could potentially use like an irregular pattern to trigger it, like with the uh, audio signal and the curve modulator, or you could just do it in the traditional kind of uh, side trance, side chain sense of the word by just applying an LFO and drawing in your own pattern and applying that to a gain uh, module in the plugin. So let's say, for example, add a gain, set the mode to percentage, and let's draw in an LFO. And then we want to set it to one over four. Now what we're going to do is the generally, like when we're doing a sidechain kind of base for Psytrance, we want these kind of square patterns like this because you want it to have this you know very regimented very clean very regimented very clean dynamics you know so being able to actually zoom in and get the exact curves that you want and do this like really really clinically is the reason that makes uh, it, it's the reason why this is actually so much more powerful uh, than LFO tool in my opinion so let's set this to zero and then let's set this to modulate this by 50%. You see how you can draw in those really tight kind of curves uh, using the LFO. And you know, you can even, for example, like open up the window maximize it and like draw in the curves if you have like a drawing tablet or something like that you know if you want to get these really organic dynamic curves you can do something like that you know if you really really want to but like i said uh, just having the control if you want to do that kind of thing it's super cool tip number 40 i want to talk about the hidden clipper in the transient shaper module in the kilohertz stuff so it's not hidden because you can actually see it says clip, but how to use it is a little bit, uh, it eluded me at first. Let's just put it that way. So let's just have a look here at the transient shaper module. Notice how it has this clip parameter. So what this does is it means that it applies an internal optical clipper, I believe at zero dB. So generally speaking, you're not mixing your stuff at that kind of level anyway. So to actually make most use of this kind of clipping algorithm, what you want to do is you actually want a gain before and after. And then what you want to do is you want to create a macro that's going to actually modulate the one by, say, for example, 10%. 
and the other one down by minus 10%. So that, for example, you're gaining up the signal, then it's clipping it, and then you're gaining it down again. Essentially, by doing that, you're reducing the threshold of the clipper. So you can actually hear the clipping algorithm happening. You might have to actually do it more because as you can see here, we're only doing six dBs by using this 10%, um, which might not be enough to actually clip some sound sources. So let's say, for example, go 50%. So we've got 30 dBs and minus 50%, so minus 30 dBs afterwards. So then let's just call this macro clip. And so this is on the drum bus. So just due to the nature of how clipping works, I tend to find that the kind of after the, the gaining down afterwards tends to skew the kind of gain factor of the algorithm. So what I want to do is I actually want to put a I want to send this macro through two remaps. The first one is going to be gaining the signal up by 50 percent or 30 dBs. And the second one is going to be gaining it down uh, by 30 dBs or by minus 50%. And then on this one, what we want to do is we actually want to change the linearity of the way that this curve works. And to really, really fine tune it to sound the best, it's all about like tuning these kind of curves. And you can kind of create your own, own custom clipping al algorithms by doing that. And so just to kind of add a little bit of extra source, what I want to do is I want to say on this clip macro, what we want to do is right at the end of the sweep, we're just going to sweep this attack up, pump up and sustain down just to give it a bit of extra punch so that as you're clipping it, you still retain some of the transient. And then what I want to do is let's put this all on to a single lane. And then what we can use, we can do is we can use this mix to create like a parallel chain, for example. So we can say dry, wet, because sometimes you want that harsh clipping sound, but you don't want it to be 100% wet. You still want some dry just to add some volume or overall loudness to what you're doing. So tip number 41, I have actually explained this in a previous video. I want to go a little bit more in depth as to why I think it's so useful. And that's the ability to modulate loop points in the curve modulator in Faceplant. So what I want to do is just pull up a quick wavetable over here. Uh, maybe let's go with something like metallic comb down two octaves. So what we can do here is let's start creating a curve modulator. So what I want to do is set this to sync. And let's say, for example, something like uh, four over four, so like a bar's length. And here, what we can do is we can draw in some parameters or some, some steps in our sequence. And let's say, for example, set this to modulate the frame over here. So what we're gonna wanna do is set this to this loop mode to infinite. So here what we can do is we can actually extend the uh, size of the table like this or the curve like this. And now if you jump in, you can actually see it's now extended the size in the actual draw thing. So we can actually now draw in more shapes. So for example, we set this to eight over eight. So now what we can do is we can actually say grid size of like 16 and say 14 here or eight over four. And now we have you know, more steps or more resolution. So the coolest thing uh, that I want to show you guys here is that you can modulate these curve loop points. So for example, we can set this macro to modulate this inwards like this. It's going to make that loop point smaller and smaller and smaller.
So what we want to do is we want to set up a remap and then say, for example, set the macro to the remap. And then on the remap, we wanted to step by the amount of steps in the sequence. So let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there must be 16 in total. So let's say a steps, 16 steps over here. So it'll be, uh, no, that's eight. So we want to set this to eight and then it'll allow us, sorry, we want to set this to 16 and it should allow us to put in linear steps like this. It should be right. And now if we set this to modulate the curve by 100%, look how it's going to step on the actual lines. So it's going to snap to the grid. That is so cool. So what we want to do here is let's duplicate this remap and let's unassign the input. And so this is actually going to be our start point. So let's unassign this and set this to this one and this to this one. So let's put this one in the front here. Uh, this is going to be loop end, loop start. And so this one let's assign to this, this loop over here. So now we can actually assign, you know, you see it steps up or down. We can go loop start and loop end. In fact, we should perhaps invert this so that it steps downwards like that. You see, you can actually just right click and say invert that macro. So it comes downwards like this. That's really cool. Okay, loop start and loop end. Okay, we're getting somewhere. So now what we're going to do is duplicate this curve. And as you can see, it keeps the modulations intact. So when we say loop end on this one or loop start and loop end on this one, it applies the exact same settings to this. So we could use this to draw in gate kind of uh, pattern. So let's say draw in something like just kind of random. And then we can apply this to a filter or something like that. Okay, so tip number 42 is about stacking the comb filters in Snapheap or Multipass or whichever host you're using. You can do it actually in Faceplant as well. But I like to do it in Snapheap and then create these kind of like stacked comb presets. And there's a couple of really interesting things you can do to create uh, ways of uh, tweaking it. So for example, the whole idea of stacking it is to be able to just put a bunch of comb filters and this kind of emulates it's not exactly the same as like feedback but it emulates the same idea of uh, feedback and comb filters in that it just gets it creates a much more resonant uh, characteristic to the sound so the whole idea of this is that you want them all to be tuned or you could have weird chaotic stuff happening so, so to be able to maintain this i usually put a remap in straight away then let's say, for example, just assign the macro to the remap because then we can kind of change this to whatever we want. We can have an LFO, whatever. Um, so then here, let's say, for example, set this to modulate this by 100%. I believe like around 56% or so is like the maximum that it can actually map to. Or actually, in fact, you know what we want is we actually want a, we want a bipolar macro and a bipolar remap so that we can tune it up and down. Okay, so about 56% or so is the extent of that modulation. So now if we duplicate this, you'll see it actually duplicates that as well so that the modulation is the same with both of these. Are you guys following that? 
So here, if we say, for example, just duplicate this all the way till the end. So now we have seven comb filters. You'll notice that the sound is like much more drastic now. <laughs> So with this kind of thing, you know, it can get really, really chaotic. So what I'll do is I'll usually just have a dynamics uh, just to limit anything that's going to peak at the end of the signal. So the idea here is we want to create a system that can mix it in like more and more drastic as we go. So we're going to do that with a series of remaps. So let's say, for example, turn all of these mixes down. So now we just have one comb filter. So it's nice, but it's not that gnarly comb filter sound that we know. Do you know what I mean? So here, this is actually the, like the secret of this whole operation. Yeah, let's put in a gain and just gain it down by, let's say, minus six dBs. And instead of mixing this one, we're going to use the mix on the actual lanes over here. So let's put in a remap and let's set this. Let's just call this uh, feedback. Remember, it's not like real feedback, but we're just simulating the sound of, the, of, of feedback by stacking up these remaps. So here, for example, we're going to modulate the mix up. And let's say, for example, do this in like the first quadrant. It's going to go up like that. And then we're going to copy this. And then this one is going to start here and then modulate up like this. And then this one is going to modulate the mix of this channel. So let's just get a quick example of what this sounds like now quickly. OK, so I think minus 6 dB is a bit drastic. Let's go for minus 5. You can hear there's like an audio volume drop as it kind of uh, fades in there. Then here in this last one, we can just do a slow fade up and maybe do like a couple of comb filters in this one just to go like really extreme right at the end. Cool, that sounds awesome. So the trick is also now you can actually stack up various different ones with stereo, or you could have them all as stereo to get different ones, kind of different tones of the comb filter. So I like to save different presets. So for example, like I'll have one that's just stereos, one that's plus, one that's minus, so that you can get like the exact kind of comb filter sound that you want. Okay, so tip number 43 is how to create a phaser filter. So you can actually create your own, you know, like I said, your own custom filters in Slice EQ so you can get the peaks and stuff exactly how you want them. But the easiest way to create a phaser filter in the kilohertz ecosystem is just using the phaser. So the idea is that you set the depth down to zero so that it's static. And then the cutoff becomes the cutoff or the frequency of your phaser filter. The easiest way to outline something like this would be on just a kind of basic-ish FM kind of sound. So what I want to do is, let's just say, for example, put in a sine and a triangle, and we can set up a basic FM patch. But again, like the comb filters, you can make these much, much more brutal if you just stack them up. So let's say, for example, open a snap heap, put in the phaser, turn the depth down, and let's say, for example, turn the order all the way up, and then we can stack this up. So let's say turn the cutoff down and the spread down, and then we can have uh, actually the order as well, and then these can all be modulated. So let's say, for example, set this by 100%, 100%, and then this one can be the 
spreads. In fact, you can't modulate the order, I remember now. But let's say, for example, cut off and spread. So now if we just stack this up more and more, it's gonna become like more of a phaser filter. Uh, even just on a saw wave, this sounds fantastic. So tip number 44 is when using the Convolver, is specifically with bass sounds, I found that using a transient shaper before it almost always sounds better. So the whole idea with this is that I found that specifically with these kind of more weirder, glitchy, phasey things with the Convolver in the kilohertz thing, it's kind of smears the transient in a maybe slightly unpleasant way. But putting a transient shaper before it and really accentuating the sound of the transient shaper by pumping the attack, the pump, and the sustain down, you can really accentuate the sound of the Convolver. Listen to this. I believe it's got to do with the fact that like the impulse responses are based on a, a dynamic sound and when you feed it a source that's dynamic, it reacts differently. So this also works with amplitude modulation. So for example, or I mean like, you know, taking a gain module, popping it in there, turning it down, and then using one of the envelopes from the patch to modulate that. But I find it most effective with the transient shaper because it still retains some of that audio through after the attack. Okay, so tip number 45 is creating custom reverbs inside Snap Heap or Multipass, but using mainly a chorus. So not using any reverbs at all. So what I wanna do quickly is just create a very basic sine wave patch so, so with this kind of thing, I generally find it a little bit easier to break it up into several little snap heaps inside the big snap heap. So for example, the first one we'll call like early reflections and diffusions. Um, for those who remember the video that I recently did. So with these, I kind of usually turn the amount of modulation on the, on the chorus down quite a bit. And then I'll turn the like taps and delays up so that it's more apparent, but there's not much like, kind of wiggling happening with the sound. And then with this, we just want to you know, stack it up and with each one put a slightly different delay time. So using this idea, we're creating that kind of diffusion network like we did with the all pass filters in that Bitwig tutorial. So here's another little tip. So let's say for example, just delete all of these. If we set a modulator or like a macro to the first one, then what we can do is just duplicate it and change it slightly and just start stacking it up like this because then this will control all of them. So now the trick to simulate feedback is we put a delay, set the mix to 100%, and then use the lanes mix. And so what happens is this only applies to the tails of the delay.
And with these kind of sharp uh, reverb sounds, I like to add this reverser. Just smooths out the overall effect of it all. Especially like if you add it in here and there, in, in the patch, like all over the place. We can even create some kind of pre-delay effect by setting up a delay over here. And then if we set it to mix 100% feedback down, then this will become the pre-delay amount. So we can actually set a macro for this, say, pre-delay. And then we can create a macro to modulate all of these chorus stack macros that we created earlier. And that's going to create like, it's going to create more reverb tail, for example. Uh, we can actually turn that feedback up as well, and then we can just say size. Okay, so tip number 46, I guess this is kind of universal with most delay things, but creating glitches by modulating the delay time. So this is really cool, like in combination with that thing I showed you guys about syncing up loops and stuff inside your sampler. So the idea of this is to modulate the delay times over here. So let's say for example, just add in a LFO, let's set it to bipolar, and let's set it to modulate this. Uh, I don't actually want to sweep all the way because uh, let's say, for example, set it to 100 milliseconds and get this to modulate it by 50%. So I found with this kind of thing, you want to sync it. So it's like, and let's say eight over four. Now notice how we get this like tape slow down type of effect. So with this kind of thing, I prefer to do like steps, but you can do, you know, these things if you want, these curves in, in between the steps to get some really interesting modulations. If you stack these up, you can get some really, really cool effects. So another neat trick is, let's say, for example, open up a snap heap and let's say put in a delay over here. Now we can time these to like one over 32. So you could also like in, in my tutorial, what I did is I used gates uh, and a LFO pattern to actually switch. But I think the easiest way to actually do this is using the trans gate. So let's say, for example, we want this on the first step in the second step, we want this step. And then what we want to do is set them to parallel. So you can create almost like deeply glitchy infiltrators type stuff by just sequencing delays that are being modulated. Okay, so tip number 47, I want to talk about some more advanced concepts for modeling your own custom filters. So I did speak a little bit about creating custom filters, but I want to talk a little bit more about creating more advanced filters. So you could either use filters that already exist and model your own custom filters on those, or you can create your own unique custom um, ideas. I want to show you a really handy tool for using to uh, create a model of a plugin or filter or something that may exist. I think for this tutorial, let's make a kind of basic model of the uh, SEM filter. I'm going to use the Arturia filter SEM plugin for this. So the idea with plugin doctor is that you can see the harmonic curve of the spectrum based on the 
uh, different settings and stuff that you dial in. So for example, you notice here that it's chopping off a bit of the high frequencies and a bit of the low frequencies, you know, as soon as we enable the filter, you know, you can dry wet. As soon as you turn up the wet, it kind of applies a bit of a, you know, it removes the lows and removes the high frequencies. So obviously that gives it that warm, you know, analog tone or, or whatever it is that we know from these specific filters. So just straight off the bat, having something like Plugin Doctor is incredibly powerful because it allows you to, it kind of takes the veil off a lot of this plugin marketing that we see. You know, a lot of people say X plugin is better than Y plugin, but you know, if they're performing exactly the same mathematically on a graph, is there any difference? What we want to do here is load in an instance of Snap Heap. So notice now how we have two lines. One represents the curve from the Arturia filter SEM. The other represents the curve from Snap Heap. Obviously, Snap Heap is a flat frequency response. There is no nonlinear characteristics in the plugin. And also, there's no effects that we've actually loaded in here yet. So, of course, there's going to be no change to the audio. So what we can do is we can start loading up stuff like let's say, for example, load in a slice EQ. We'll also, we'll also notice that there's a bit of a gain reduction. So we can add a gain module as well, just to kind of fine tune it closer to the reference. So let's pop open slice EQ within Snap Heap and we can use this to start dialing in the curve so that it uh, emulates what we have here in our plugin doctor window. So we may have to open up this panel over here and just fine tune some of these parameters to get it to just, just, just fit snugly in that curve. You might not be able to get it exact, but I think something like that in terms of the tops will be close enough. And let's go down to the bottoms. Let's see how we can tune this up. Maybe go for 6 dB. Yeah, that's it. 6 dB per octave at 20 hertz. So now let's look at the, what happens to the spectrum when we sweep the filter downwards. Notice how we get this like reduction in gain and it's almost like an exponential curve and it stops around the midpoint. So it goes down, stops around the midpoint and then goes down even further like that. So it's a very weird kind of response in the gain when we sweep the frequency of this filter over here. So let's try emulate that with the uh, sweep from a macro in Snap Heap. So let's say, for example, call this frequency. So now this macro is going to be at the top because we're going to be sweeping it down to actually reduce the, the frequency. So by default, this frequency is at the top. So let's put this macro at the top. So as we reduce it, we want to reduce the amount of gain. So what we can do is let's just go to like the middle point here and then match it. So it's still very linear how it sweeps from midpoint upwards. You see how with this one, it has like a curve response like that. So how we can create that curve response is obviously with a remap. What we want to do is we want to set the, uh, let's just turn this gain all the way down and let's set this frequency to modulate this remap. So now what we can do is we can set the remap to control the gain. And so here now we actually have control over the X, Y plotting of those values. So for example, we can turn it down here, make a curve here so that it'll be more of that exponential response that we're looking for in that curve. Okay, wait, it's curved the wrong way. I believe it should be like this, I think. In fact, we're not starting at zero. We're starting somewhere like this. I think that's still a bit too drastic. There we go, there we go, there we go. So notice how it's now got this kind of curve response. In fact, I think it is curved outwards like this. And then this one kind of slows down here as this one sweeps. Although I think with this one, it's less of a gain sweep and it's just that frequency sweeping down that creates that lack of gain. Does that make sense? So it's all in these remaps, you know, plotting the uh, different unique curves of each of these parameters is all in the remaps. So here, for example, this frequency sweep, let's try and dial in the top end of this frequency sweep. So for example, here, notice how it sweeps. Let's say, for example, this uh, 11 kilohertz cut. Let's sweep it all the way down and then apply a remap to control that sweep. And now what we do is we set this frequency to control the remap. And now we have control of those values as this sweeps up. In fact, it's sorry, not this one. It's this one. There we go. Okay, so now let's check out how this 
responds here. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. Although it looks like here at the top end of the sweep, the extent of that modulation goes a bit too high. So we can just carve in that exact response using the remap. So it looks like as it sweeps down, the Q factor also gets less drastic. So what we can do is we can use another remap. We can actually just duplicate this and apply this to the Q factor and reduce it as it sweeps down. So what we want to do is we actually want to invert this so that it's at the, the value that we want at the beginning of the sweep. And then as we sweep downwards, it reduces that Q factor. Do you see that? So here the amount of reduction can be dialed in with that setting. Cool, that's looking better. So when we get to about 75%, okay, it looks like the gain needs to be fine tuned a little bit. It needs to go down a bit more drastically here. Uh, that frequency can come up a little bit over there. Yeah. So once you've got this kind of like these remaps in, it's all about going in and plotting those values so that the curves line up. Sometimes you will get these parts where it's like not exact. You know, I don't think you're going to be able to actually hear that difference, uh, to be honest with you. That being said, you know, you can just go in there, keep fine tuning these values. Okay, that looks more like something that that emulates that sweep. You see that down like that. Cool. Okay, so let's have a look at the resonance characteristic here. So by default, the resonance is down. So let's just use this macro and leave it at zero. And notice how when we turn the resonance up, first and foremost, the gain increases. So we can actually use the same gain, uh, gain module to apply that uh, gain increase when we sweep the resonance. So what we do is we just say, put it on all the way, and then we can actually fine tune it like this. So let's look at what happens to the frequency when we sweep the resonance still got that same kind of that motion in terms of the linearity of that gain as it goes it kind of bumps downwards and across so here what we can actually do is i want to create a duplicate of this cut uh let's say 12 db per octave but we want to leave it at a peak let's set the frequency to 20 hertz and we want the same amount of modulation that's being applied to this one which is 100 percent, and we want the exact same curve so it was this modulation so let's apply this to this as well at a hundred percent. Now the peak node in this EQ is going to sweep at the exact same frequency as the low cut. Now what we can do is we can use this resonance parameter to modulate this gain upwards. And notice how now it gives us that, that peak. And we can fine tune that peak with this Q factor over here. You may want to also, instead of doing it with the, an extra peak, you could do it with a, the actual Q of this frequency, but then you have slightly less control. You see, if you do it with the with an extra node, you can slightly offset them and do all sorts of interesting things if you want. And so here, when this frequency goes down, notice how that resonance peaks up, whereas this one kind of goes down a bit as the frequency sweeps. So what I want to do is I want to create a modulation that is side chained by this resonance parameter that modulates that peak as the frequency sweeps. So let's add another remap. Set the frequency to that. And here we wanna invert it, okay? And then set this output to the gain from the remap here. And so as we turn it down, that will be increased. You see that? So now what we can do is we can fine tune it so that it looks similar to what the sweep is when it starts and maybe just tune it up so that it's more apparent. There we go. There we go. We're getting somewhere closer to what we want. You see this? It's all about fine tuning these values so you get that, that response that you want. So it looks like this resonance can reduce the gain a little bit more. Increase the peak here a little bit more. Okay, that's looking good. Nice. So obviously there are various other parameters which we can go into modeling. There's various other modes, low pass, high pass, band pass. That being said is I'm gonna leave all of that up to you guys. I'm just giving you the concepts and the how to's and you guys can go and, and take that and expand it as much as you need.
Okay, so tip number 48 is how to create your own unique resonators with the flanger. So this is actually a really nice way to create resonators because there's a kind of built-in vibrato effect, which I'm gonna explain shortly. Let's dive in. So I've got a drum loop over here. So the idea with this trick is to add a flanger. So with this, what we wanna do is we wanna make sure all of these movement settings are off. So that's depth, rate, scroll, motion, spread, all of these are off. So all that we have is the feedback, the mix, and the delay. So the delay, if we turn the feedback up, you'll notice that when you turn the delay, kind of like changes the frequency of the resonating effect that you get when the feedback is high. So we can make use of this kind of tuning phenomenon of the flanger to calculate exactly, for example, uh, what milliseconds we need to set the delay to to get it to a specific frequency. So 110 hertz, which correlates to A, uh, happens to be, I think, 9.09 .09 milliseconds. I believe three octaves up from there would be 2.27. So what we can do is we can create a remap uh, let's set this macro to modulate the remap. Set this to modulate, and we can actually punch in the exact uh, milliseconds that we need to be the extent of the modulation here. So let's say 2.27. And now this macro basically tunes that resonator that we've created up by two octaves. So what we can do is we can put in something like this so that we have the uh, zero tuning up by one octave, up by two octaves, like this, so that we can modulate it and step up in those octaves. So by inverting the feedback, you get a slightly different tone uh, of the resonator. And using the depth and rate, you can actually create a vibrato effect, which is pretty interesting. So what we could do is we could also combine this with, say, for example, like uh, a randomizer, and we can turn it off and get a audio follower to trigger that random. So this is a great way of taking something like an organic percussion loop and deriving the kind of organic rhythm from it and creating a synth sound to accompany that rhythm. So this works with you know almost any kind of uh, percussive input. So tip number 49 is creating advanced cinematic stacks using the sampler and the ability to drag and drop into the sampler in Faceplant. So you're not limited to just samplers. Using this technique, you can stack it up with synth voices to create really, really diverse cinematic uh, atmospheres and pads. But I just wanna outline some really cool things with this that make it kind of special. So what I wanna do is I wanna just combine um, a couple of like some of my favorite uh, sounds from outside of Faceplant and we're gonna create some layer sounds that we could throw into Faceplant to create a, a kind of stack. So let's say for example, I want a, maybe like an orchestral brass stab. What I usually do is I will start kind of, uh, perhaps in the arranger view, I will start just laying out a couple of layers of sounds that I think will fit together. So for example, we've got like a brass stab here. Let me actually just create a bit of modulation on this.
Okay, so let's say for example you've now got your layers of your stacks bounced out as samples. Now we can jump into phase plant and start dragging the samples into our sampler. So if we say add a sampler here in the group section, the thing about Bitwig is you can't actually drag the sample from the timeline because the timeline uh, basically uses containers as opposed to actual audio samples. You've got to open it up and drag it from the bottom here into the sampler. One thing to note is we rendered these out in the key of A and the sampler by default looks for keys which are in C. So you can set the root over here and then it'll tune it all as you need. So now when I play a C, it's going to come out as a C. Now we can start uh, kind of expanding this idea by just duplicating it and then dragging the next stack in there. So the reason I duplicated is because what I want to do is actually lock the root over here. And then when I drag a new sample in, it's going to keep it at A. So now we can just carry on expanding this idea. So now I just want to uh, toggle all these active. And now we've just got one instance of Faceplant, which has our entire kind of sound stack built in. So depending on how you want to do this, you may want, for example, samples to be stacked in groups. So for example, we could have like these two pad like sounds in the same group. And then we just modulate using this level as a kind of main uh, source. Um, and then for example, like these two, we can have grouped in a group like this, and then a third group so that we have a much a, a kind of simpler patch to work with. So the cool thing now is that we can actually play chords and we get a kind of granular like response because these chords scrub through the sample at different rates because of the pitch, obviously. So now what we can start doing is going in and actually adjusting the attack and release settings so that we can actually play a chord and it will kind of uh, release out over a long period of time. Yes, we want something more like that. Uh, we also want to maybe play with some of these loop points. So these can be modulated to create really expressive sounds that kind of change over time. Um, I like to use randoms with a 100% jitter and smooth for this kind of thing. So what we can do is just apply this to for example, like the start and a different one to like the length. And so now you'll see like the sample is going to change depending on these random modulators. Uh, and we can kind of just keep stacking that idea further and further. So this random can now control this layer over here. So then what I like to do to give it like even more expressiveness is to, let's say, for example, assign random parameters to modulate. So each of these groups, we can modulate the levels like up and down. So it like swings between them. You know what I mean? Uh, and then we can do the same with the first group over here. Tip number 50 is going to be utilizing a bunch of these tips that I have showed you throughout this video to create one heck of a big generative patch that's going to automatically create ambient music while we sit back and enjoy it. So the idea of a generative patch is usually to be able to hold a single note and the rest of the music is created via generative means. So that's with random uh, or any other type of uh, system that's going to create kind of new music at every loop. I enjoy creating generative patches because sometimes it can be quite therapeutic. You know, as a music producer, often we get these, uh, a sense of option paralysis where there's so much choice that we tend to forget about just enjoying the music and enjoying the music creation process. 
creating generative patches kind of forces you to sit back and just listen. And it kind of forces you to just enjoy the musical process or enjoy what's, ha what's coming out of the speakers because you can't really change it. So I want to talk about some of my favorite ways of doing this. So I have actually done a full in-depth tutorial on how to create generative stuff in Faceplant. But what I want to do today is to just tie up a lot of the ideas that we've spoken about today, maybe include some of the things that I may have missed and just create a really cool generative ambient patch. So what we can do is we can perhaps start thinking about, you know, maybe we want a specific scale throughout the entire kind of patch. So what we can start doing is thinking about, um, you know, what scale we want and whether we want to perhaps create some kind of chord in the patch as well. One thing I like doing is creating a chord via, you know, actually having three oscillators or like three different voices that you actually create manually in the patch. And then what we can do is we can modulate those voices using randoms on these. So for example, if I hold a note now, So what we could potentially do is have like a random smooth and then get this to modulate the level. So it kind of goes in and out. And same thing with the third voicing. No, not the pitch, the level. So we could do it with the chords mode, uh, you know, not necessarily with the uh, individual voicing like this. I like doing it like this because then we have individual control over each of these levels. Then what we can do is we can further stretch the voicing by adding something like octaves. And then this allows us to create, let's say, inversions of the chord. Okay, so what I want to do is just thoughtfully start arranging things. So I want every one of these lanes to send through to a master. We can put a snap heap outside of the plugin that can control like uh, any type of like mastering, processing, and that kind of thing that we want to do. Let's just put in a long MIDI note so that it can keep triggering uh, so that we don't have to hold any notes down. And just so that you can see, it's just a single static note. That's the idea of the generative patch single static note, and then everything is kind of randomized. I want to set up a modulator that's going to modulate the random speed all of all of these chords so we can slow it down and what we also want to do is just set it so that none of these randoms are actually triggering that it's so it never trigger from note on so that we don't get that sudden jerk at the beginning of the bar because sometimes generative patches you don't want to know when the beginning of the bar is that's kind of the wonder that the kind of journey takes you on Okay, let's create some kind of randomized lead line here. So what I want to do is I want to use an LFO table as a means to create some kind of rhythm for this patch. So what we can do is we can also use this to trigger a random. So let's just turn it down and so that when we change the speed, it's going to randomize alongside the rhythm of this. So this is cool because now we can use this to trigger like different pitches. So for example, send this through to a remap. 
get this sent to the remap. And then we can use one of the presets, for example, like one of the scales presets, and then get this to modulate this by 24. We can also draw in our own custom scales in the remaps. And then finally we can create a base layer. So let's just call this lead. And actually just duplicate this one. Call this base. Uh, we just remove some of these, like the level things, but I want the same pitch running through here. We just want to turn it down by like two octaves and then send this through to lane three. Cool, okay, so let's look at some final processing. <coughs> let's put a snap heap over here. So I'm not sure if I did mention this already in the video, but we can nest multi-passes inside snap heaps. So for example, we could have like a, another kind of process of like reverbs and stuff on the tops, whereas the low frequencies are kind of coming through clean. Sometimes with this kind of thing, a nice trick is to add a multi-pass, put a slice EQ, and kind of create almost like your own custom soothe by adding a audio follower and getting this to modulate the mix of this EQ. And then what you do is you set the input to band, the, the band that it correlates to. So for example, B1 to band three. And so now if there's any, like too much mid range, it'll dip it out automatically. So we can expand this further into more bands. So we, for example, we could put one here then just offset it slightly, add an audio follower here and then get this to come from band four. The coolest thing about these types of patches is you can just change the note and it'll fit into whatever the like key of your track is. So let's say for example, we're not writing in C, we're writing in like G sharp. We can just shift that and it should shift everything that we've created in the patch to suit that.
Oh my gosh, I can't believe we got through all of that. This is probably quite a lengthy video. So I do appreciate you for watching the whole thing. And I'm sure you got at least a few usable tricks that you can take out of this. So yeah, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm gonna be posting a bunch of what I think are the most useful presets out of the stuff I've made from this video to my Patreon for all my $5 supporters. So if you wanna know what that's all about, check out the link in the description. I also just wanted to quickly remind you guys that hopefully by the time this video is out, my snappy preset pack is also out. Again, if that's your thing, check out the links in the description. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time. Cheers.